and our response to it will not be dependent on circumstances. It will always be dependent upon who God is and upon His power in our lives. I am very happy today. Uh, have you ever said in your life, I couldn't be any more, I can't be any more happy than I am today? Uh, and, uh, and you're not worried for tomorrow because tomorrow you'll even be more happy than today. Why is that? Because the blessings of God, they are new every morning. The blessings of God, hindi yung iniinit. Tapos hindi inuuli. Whatever God's blessings are, he, did, he, he allows you to experience them today. And tomorrow, it will be a newer experience. So you can say, I, can, I am the happiest person at, that I can be today. And, and you're not worried, but how about tomorrow? Maybe I won't be as happy or happier tomorrow. You don't worry about that. Because tomorrow, the blessings of God, they are fresher and they are newer. And you can declare once again, tomorrow, wow, you are the happiest person that you can ever be. I want to show you a, uh, uh, a diamond, but I'll do it differently this time. We have five M's. How many M's? This is not M and M. Okay. Five M's. For first base, you have magnification. Second base, you have what? Missions. Missions. Third base, you have membership. Fourth base, you have ministry. And fifth base, you have maturity. These are the bases we are going to cover together as we journey together as followers of Jesus Christ. The first phase, this is, uh, we, hindi, babalik muna. Okay, first phase, it says, uh, magnification. Magnification is just another word for worship. You are made to worship. You know what worship is? This is our most passion for God. When God is your highest joy, is your greatest delight, is your supreme treasure, and nothing makes you happier than God. That is worship. And that's how God created us. But when sin entered, our passion for God died. Okay? Our passion for God is it's in a coma. So what happens when God saves you, you know what happens? Your passion for God, it comes back to life. And you enjoy, you get to enjoy the presence of God once again. Just because you attend a praise service, just because you give your tithe and offering, just because you, uh, you, uh, you put on your clothes and you attend a religious gathering, it does not mean that your passion for God has already come back to life. It requires a miracle for that to happen. And until you encounter the incomparableness of God, it, it doesn't take place. So, in first phase, we're, we're talking about the grace of God and the love of God and the heart of God and the forgiveness of God. And, 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 uh, and when we do that, chances are, if you don't resist, okay, chances are, if you don't fight it, you know what's going to happen? The power that created the heavens and the earth will be the same power that will create in you a new heart and a new spirit and a new mind and you just want God more than anything and you can say with Paul, I count all things as lost in comparison to the treasure that God has become for me. That's worship. Worship is not attending a service. Worship is when your heart is most fulfilled and most satisfied and most contented and most happy and most joyful and most thrilled and most excited with God. Not heaven, but with the God of heaven. Okay? Because you can want heaven more than you want God and you just use God to get into heaven. That means worship has not been established in your heart 
Yeah, that's why each time you come to Saturday praise, what are we talking about? We're talking about the heart of God. We're talking about the character of God. We're talking about who God is. Because until we get to know that God is beyond our imagination, that God is beyond anything great we could ever imagine, and we are as little as the smallest type of dust there is, worship can take. And that's why we are here. Encountering the incomparableness of God. Now when you get it, when, when that happens, when your passion for God comes back to life, you know what the Bible calls them? The new birth. You are born again. Okay? The new birth is not a denomination, it's not a religious organization, it is a miraculous experience. It is a resurrection experience. The immeasurable power of God raises you back. To life. Now you're able to worship. You're able to praise. You're able to enjoy God for who He is. Then you go to second base. You know what second base is? It's mission. You know what's mission? It's joining God in His mission. There is a great battle. There is a great controversy. There is a battle between good and evil. Okay? Satan has hijacked the glory of God. Before you were created, before the world was even created, there was already a battle going on. And God was already on mission. And God created you so that you can join Him in what He has been doing all along. You join God in establishing worship in hearts and places where there is none. That is the mission of God. It's not how much uh, he can transfer from earth to heaven. It's how much people can get to know how great a God that He is. So there's a great controversy. There's a great battle. God is on a mission and God is inviting you to join Him. That's second base. Then you go to third base. What is third base? Membership or fellowship. You become a... You start experiencing... And you start doing life together with whom? With fellow God enjoyers. Okay? The people who, who, whose passion has come back to life. Each of these people. You get to fellowship with them because you are a family of people who, tre who treasures God, who treasure God above all. Then you go to the fourth base. This is ministry. This is service. You serve with passion so that you can make God known to others who don't know Him and it's such a joy to your heart. And, and you don't do it by, just by singing or by preaching. It's according to your shape, your spiritual gift, your heart, your abilities, your personality, and your experience. So when you do it, you do it with all the joy you, you're, you're able to experience. And then you go to the home run, maturity. What is maturity? This, this would include the practices wherein your passion for God and passion for the lost and passion for His people keeps growing and growing and growing and growing each day of your life. You know what's going to happen? You don't simply sit and listen. It's going to be your greatest joy to make God known. You are a disciple and you make disciples. You are an enjoyer of God and you make other people enjoyers of God. You made a home run and you help people also have a home run. And, and this we do knowing who God is and joining in Him in what He has been doing. And I don't have to explain the next slide. Okay, uh, click, 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 click. These are the first base resources as I've shown you many Saturdays ago. When, you're, when you finish this, you go to second base. That second base has this same, okay? Different materials and different lessons until we just, we just, uh, we are just fully aligned with what God wants us to do with our lives and we are becoming the disciples God meant for us to be. Amen? Amen. Now let's go to 
your outline. I want to begin with a self-evaluation quiz. You ready for a quiz? Quiz. It's just self-evaluation. I'd like to know how would you answer these questions. Number one, do you ever feel guilty when you relax, knowing you have a lot of things to do? Uh-huh. Number two, do you often feel dissatisfied or discontented with yourself or your situation? Like you always uh, have this thing in your heart, I hope uh, you're in another situation instead of the situation you're in. Here's number three. Do you have a tendency to see something wrong with things rather than what's right? So here's the situation. Your tendency is to see what's wrong and not what's right. Here is number four. Do you ever find yourself using these phrases regularly? I have to. I must. I should. I ought to. They all use those words. Number uh, five, do you ever feel frustrated or maybe even angry at God, feeling that His expectations on you are unreasonable? Masyado naman yun. Masyado naman yung hinihingi na ng and the last one, does your relationship to God seem like a burden rather than a blessing? Self-evaluation. Your, your, your journey, your spiritual walk, is it wow, a joyful walk or is it maraming mong If you can answer yes to any of these questions, then probably you're afflicted with what you call perfectionism. Ha! What's the word? Perfectionism. What is perfectionism? Perfectionism is trying to prove my word by being perfect. So you want perfection, you want to attain to perfection, you want to become blameless and faultless, but the reason is to prove your significance, to prove your worth. It is a counterfeit of spiritual growth. It is not genuine spiritual maturity. It's not the real thing by trying to prove you're important through your works of trying to be perfect. And uh, for many dedicated, committed believers, for many dedicated followers of Jesus, this is the number one hang up. You know how it happens? It's like this. First you become a Christ follower. Then you hear about grace. Wow! What a deal! Because you're just amazed with the grace of God. Imagine, you can become a Christ follower, you can enter into the more abundant life, and you can experience the eternal life of God, and you can experience the purposes of God in your life, and it's not by works. It's not by earning it, it's not by, it's not by doing anything, it's a gift, it's the grace of God, it's the love of God, so you don't work your way into eternity, you don't barter with God, you don't struggle in order to get it, it's just a free gift, and inevitably you start enjoying it, wow, this is life, this is the more abundant life, this is just so good, but as time goes by, you start thinking, this has to be too good to be true. Hindi naman pwede yung sobrang sarap nito, walang kapalit. Siguro may kapalit ito. So you start thinking like that. Really, you say, I ought to help God out a little bit. A little bit. Surely, He's, He expects something of me. Surely, He expects something to gain his approval, to gain his smile, to gain his hat on my back. Hindi naman pwede hindi pwede lahat. Kaya naman siguro, may gagawin ka rin para God will smile at you. So you fall. Okay? So you fall into one of two traps. There are two enemies of grace. Two enemies of grace. Number one, 
It's called legalism. You heard, you heard the word legalism? You know what's legalism? This is trying to earn God's approval through rules. That's legalism. So you're trying to earn the approval of God by obedience to the law. And the other one is what we're talking about. It's called perfectionism. This is trying to prove your worth by being perfect. So legalism, this is trying to gain God's approval by keeping the rules. Perfectionism, this is trying to prove your importance, your values, your significance, your worth by being perfect. And there's an entire book in the scripture that talks about these uh, enemies of grace, to combat these enemies of grace, the book of Galatians. So we go to our first verse. It's found in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 3. Everyone, what does it say? You began your life in Christ by the Spirit. Now you are trying to make it complete by your own power. That is what? That's good. So you start your life in Christ by the Spirit, and then you're trying to complete it by your own power. That's why we want to look at liberating grace. We want to look at the grace of God that sets free. How can you break out of the prison of perfectionism? Try to prove your worth by being perfect. Because if, if, if you understand this, how to relax. Okay? How to relax in God's grace. You know what's going to happen? You're going to find a new level of joy in your walk with God. You are going to find a new level of freedom that probably you never experienced. Like the greatest thing you've ever experienced was when you got to know God and it stayed there. When you first became a follower or a believer of Jesus. Before we go and see how to relax in the grace of God. Just three things. What does perfectionism do to you? How harmful it is. Number one. And number one, it defeats what? It defeats my initiative. Have you ever uh, had a project and uh, you haven't seen to get started on even though you really, really want to do it? But until now, you have not started. It's a good thing, it's the right thing to do when you think, one of these days I'm going to get around it. But until now, you're not doing it. One possible reason is perfectionism. In your mind, you're waiting. What are you waiting for? In your mind. How come you, you have not started? What are you waiting for? You're waiting for the perfect circumstance. You are waiting for the perfect timing. You're waiting for the perfect environment. You are waiting till the kids get out of school. You are waiting till a certain amount of money comes in. You're waiting and as a result, perfectionism causes procrastination. You set your standards so high and perfectionism causes paralysis and you can't get anything done. Because you're waiting for the perfect timing, environment, situation, or circumstance. Look at what the Bible says here in Ecclesiastes chapter 11 verse 4. It's really, if you wait for perfect conditions, you'll never get anything done. Okay? So perfectionism, what does it do? It defeats your initiative. Number two, it damages. What does it damage? It damages my relationships. Uh, do you enjoy being around with, with somebody who always corrects you? Uh, <laughs> the first thing that comes from the mouth, from his or her mouth, is, is correct you. How wrong you are, what you're doing. You like being mad? Nobody likes being mad. Nobody likes being mad all the time, corrected all the time, perfected all the time, straightened all the time. It's what? 
it's frustrating, it's annoying, it's irritating, what else? It's very stressful. You know the experience, I know the experience. Proverbs 79, what does the Bible say? The forgets the ships. Nagging about them, it parts the best of friends. That is BFF. Ayon, be nice. Bakit? Kasi perfection. It damages friendship. It damages relationships. The, this desire to always correct. You can't stop yourself from trying to correct others all the time. Now, all of us are perfectionists in one degree or another. No one is exempted. We're all in this bag. Okay? Now, what it does is that it causes us to look at the wrong things. You know where this is coming from? It's coming from insecurity. Because when you don't feel good about yourself, you don't want others to feel good about themselves. I'll say that again. When you don't feel good about yourself, when you don't enjoy yourself, you don't want others to be enjoying themselves also. Life is a mirror. If I don't like me, I certainly don't want you liking you. I want us to all be miserable together. Okay? So perfectionists who are harsh and demanding on other people are really harsh and demanding on who? On themselves. Okay? People who are demanding and critical of others are actually demanding and critical to themselves. They're holding themselves a high standard and because they're doing that to themselves, they hold everybody else to that standard. They take great pains in their own work, but they're also a pain to everybody else. Huh? It damages relationships. Number three, it destroys what? It destroys your joy, it destroys your happiness. Ecclesiastes 7.16, let's read it. Do not be excessively righteous. Lampas ka sa langit. And do not be overly wise. Why should you ruin yourself? Uh, this verse doesn't sound like it should be in the Bible. But it's in the Bible. Okay? So God is saying, you can take this to, ex- to the extreme. And it's not balanced anymore. And it's not working for our good. We're not talking about genuine righteousness. We're not talking about real wisdom. The verse is talking about perfectionism. Like you take one virtue and you make it like everything. And everything else is like it's not in in the right place. You're ignoring the balancing parts to it. And so, the Bible says, why why ruin yourself? In one other translation, it says, why make yourself miserable? Because again, you have your ideal self, is that right? This is what you put on your resume, that's your ideal self. There's also your actual self. And many times, there's a major gap between your ideal self and your actual self. Between... What you want to be, what you like to be, what you think you ought to be, and what you are. A major gap between the ideal and the real. So, this is what's happening. The ideal is, is always nagging the real in your mind. There's this ongoing conversation in your mind all the time. Shame up! Surely you can do better than that? Get with it! So there's this little scolding going on in your mind every day, and you say, and 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 uh, and 
when you're in a perfectionism mode, you're always saying to yourself, I'm too fat, I'm too skinny, I'm too short, I'm too tall, I'm too uncoordinated, I'm awkward, I'm always late, I'm always this, I'm never ever going to change, I'm not looking at this, I'm dumb, I'm stupid, I'm clumsy, and you just say, I'm not going to change, I'm not going to change, I'm not going So you've got to take play over and over between the ideal and the real, thinking that you're going to knock yourself into perfection. Kung talagang bibirahin mo na ang gusto yung sarili mo, baka tumino ka. But does it work? It doesn't work. Actually, the opposite is what happens. Nagging only makes you defensive, and it also makes the person you're nagging defensive. Now, your worst end lives under your skin. Your worst critic is actually yourself. So if, if you're typical, you are your own worst critic. Since we tend to resent and even dislike people who nag us, if you're always nagging yourself, what is that saying about you? What's that saying about you? If you're always nagging, And, and you always resent and even dislike people. You don't like you. Okay? You don't like you. That's what it's saying. You think uh, you're not good enough and you think by nagging yourself into what's wrong with you and that's going to motivate you to be the best person you can ever be and it's not happening. Again, it's called perfectionism. It causes you to constantly criticize yourself, put yourself down, demean yourself, degrade yourself, and this is an ongoing conversation. Now, this is the problem. You learn perfectionism. We all learn perfectionism growing up. Uh, it may have been modeled for us by the adults in our lives while we were growing up. And then you got to know Jesus, how much He loves you, and how, how God cares for you, and how gracious He is. So you step across the line, you surrender to God, you give your life to Him. But this is what, this is what happened. The, the little irritating voice that, that keeps on nagging at you and telling you you're up to no good, You took it off your parents, you took it off your culture, you took it off uh, your teacher, and then you made it God's voice. And now you've got God all the time saying to you, Come on, can't you do anything with that? Shape up, be holy, that day. Uh, it was like uh, the voice of the culture, of the society, of your parents, of Adna. You made it the voice of God. This constant big critic in the sky. Now, what is the antidote to perfectionism? You want the antidote? You ready for therapy? You ready to go to the psychiatrist? Uh, you ready to take pills? Okay, perfectionism, since we have it to one degree or another, the solution, the antidote, is not found in a person. It's not found in, uh, by watching Oprah. Okay, or who's that? Doctor, Dr. Phil, or Dr. Oz, or Kaisin and Dr. okay. That's what I said, Jerry Springer. There's only one antidote to perfectionism, and it's not, uh, it's not through listening to a series. It's not in some psychological pull yourself up by your bootstraps. There's only one antidote to perfectionism. Experience the grace of God. That's the only antidote. Experience. A genuine experience with the grace of God. When you learn to relax 
think guys now sabi na chillax learn to relax in the grace of God now you're all stressed out you're all busy uh, would it solve your stressful life if if uh, all others have 24 hours a day but you have 25 hours a day will that solve your stress lahat ang kulang sa time what if your day, you are special. You only have 24 hours in a day. You have 25, or you only have 30. Will you be less stressed? If you have more hours in a day, you'll be more stressed. You know what? Because the additional hours, you won't use it to relax. You'll use it to work and work and work. So you'll get more stressed. So it's not more time. Okay? It is learning and uh, it is learning to experience and to enjoy the grace of God. How do you do that? Acrostic. That's an acrostic. Okay? R-E-L-A-S. Relax. You ready to relax? Yes. Okay. Number one. Realize nobody is perfect. This is a no-brainer. Right? Pinag-iisip man ko ngayon. That includes you, okay? Nobody is perfect. Psalm 119 and verse 96, nothing is perfect except God's Word. That's why you need to build your life on the Word of God. Because nothing else is blameless and faultless but the Word of God. Society, what it tells you, it's not perfect. Popular opinion, what it tells you, it's not perfect. What you learned growing up, is it perfect? No, absolutely not. But the Word of God is perfect. So when you have this foundation, you're standing on solid ground, you have a perfect foundation, this might be a very, very good verse to put on your refrigerator. Nothing is perfect except God's Word. If you're married to a perfectionist, Okay? Yeah, you have permission. Do it. Put on your refrigerator. If you spend all your time trying to attain perfection, trying to make any project perfect, what are you doing? You're wasting your time. If you're trying to do that, uh, 95% still A, is that right? I think the 100, the 95, a parent. You don't have the time, you don't have the money to be perfect in everything, and you can't any way. Let's read this next verse. Ecclesiastes 7.20, There is no one on earth who does what is right all the time and never makes a mistake. But you're trying to do it. You're trying to you have to do, you, you do your best, okay? You do your best. You want to be excellent, but that is different from being perfectionistic. Uh, many years ago, uh, this is really a very, very old book. Uh, there was this old book, it says, I'm okay, you're okay. I don't know if, if you've seen that book. I'm okay, you're okay. And it's not true. Uh, I'm not okay, and you're really not okay. That's the truth. And uh, if if you say I'm okay, you're okay, deep inside, you're thinking, who am I kidding? As you look at the different areas of your life, is everything okay? Is everything perfect? No. So, there are some areas in your life that are definitely not okay. Do you agree? Okay. So, all the little affirmations in the world are not going to make you okay. Because you are imperfect. I am not perfect. So the point is this. The truth is, I'm not okay. You're not okay. But because of the grace of God, 
God, that's okay. So you don't try to psych up yourself. Don't worry, don't worry, everything's okay. It's not the little affirmations you put into your mind that solves it. I'm not okay, you're not okay. But because of the grace of God, everything is okay. I'm imperfect and there's a lot of things in my life that are not okay. You are imperfect and there's a lot of things in your life which are not okay. But when you let the grace of God be pregnant, that's okay. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to be that person that does not commit mistake at any point in time in your life. Now, what does this mean? Does it mean God is not interested in your growth? Does it mean God is not interested in your maturity? Does that mean you don't have to repent? I'm not okay. You're not okay. But by the grace of God, because we allow God in our lives, that's okay. It doesn't mean that God doesn't want you to change and work on your areas that need that needs development. God wants you to change. But when God says you're okay because of my grace, that does not mean you can just keep on being a jerk the rest of your life. Okay? It just means that God is not waiting for you to change for Him to love you. It simply means God is not waiting for you to repent. God is not waiting for you to be mature before He accepts you. You are loved. You are accepted. You are embraced. You are welcome just as you are. That is what we mean when we say, I'm not okay, you're not okay, but because of the grace of God, that is okay. Because you're accepted even if you're not perfect. Even if you don't have everything together. Letter E, what's letter E? Letter E, this would be enjoy God's unconditional. So, realize no one is perfect. That's what R stands for. Letter E, you enjoy. What will you enjoy? The unconditional love of God. First John 3 1. See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called. We should be called the children of God. And that is what? That is what we are. Now uh, we have a problem a bit. Sometimes we think believers are God's children. But non believers, they're not God's children. But you go to the story of the prodigal son, okay, the lost, the prodigal son, he, he, he left the father, right? When he left the father, was he still the son? So you would be lost, but you're still the son. But you're a lost son. That's why when he came home, what did the father say? This son of mine was dead and was lost, but now he is found and he is alive. Okay? You are a child of God. But apart from Jesus, you don't have the experience of what it is to be a child of God. It's one thing to be a child of God. It's another thing to enjoy your sonship with God. It's possible for a child to be separated from his parents and that child never knew the embrace and the compassion and the mercy and the kindness and the forgiveness of the parents. So that child needs to come home. Not in order to become a child of the parent, but in order to experience his sonship or her daughters. Now, 
when you don't know God, the tendency is this. You don't to see God as... Your understanding of God will be limited to that of a servant and a master relationship. Servant-master relationship. Uh, who feels more comfortable in the family? The servant or the child? A child, right? Here's the difference. A servant is accepted and appreciated on the basis of what he does. A child is accepted and appreciated on the basis of who he is, right? A servant starts the day how? Anxious and worried that his work will please his master. A child rests in the secure love of his family. A servant is accepted because of his workmanship. A child is accepted because of his relations. A servant is accepted because of his productivity and his performance, but a child is accepted because of his position in the family. At the end of the day, the servant has peace in his mind only if he's proven his worth by his work. But the next morning, he starts with anxiety again. Will I have a will I have this kind of work that will be approved and pleasing to my master? But if it so happened during the day he bungled and he messed up. He'd be in uh, the danger of what? Being terminated. But the son or the daughter spills the milk, leaves his or her bed undone, still accepted in the family. When a servant fails, his whole position is at stake. In fact, he might lose his job. But when a child fails, he is grieved because he's hurt, he has hurt his parents, and he'll be corrected and disciplined, but he's not afraid of being thrown out of, of the family. Uh, you never try teaching uh, your child to walk. Uh, you, you've seen a parent trying to teach a child to walk. And then the child stumbles. Huh? Four. What would you say if the parent says, You dummy, everyone walks, walk! Okay? So, you know, why can't you walk? You ought to try harder. Get with it! Would you scold on your kids for trying to walk? Would you scold them for something? You just help them. You love them. Do you love your children at every stage of their growth? Or do you wait for them to mature before you love them? Di ka pa nakakalaka din. Pag nakakalaka ka na, tsaka ka mga nga. Ganun ba yung parent? You don't know how to use the spoon and the fork. You poo in your diaper. I'll wait. When uh, you matured enough, then I'll embrace you, then I'll love you. No, we don't do that. We love our children at every stage of their growth. But some of us think God is waiting on us to grow up before He's ever going to smile on us. But kasi mature ko na si Moses, siguro mag smile na rin when I am as passionate as Paul the Apostle, then maybe I will have God's approving smile. Did you know that you could be perfect at every level? Like a child, a one-year-old child could be perfect as a one-year-old child. Okay? And he could be perfect as a five-year-old child. And could be perfect as a as a sixth grader, could be perfect as a fourth year high school student. You could be perfect at every level. Because the Bible says first, 
uh, the seed and then uh, like it sprouts and every level perfection okay doesn't mean mature so you can be perfect it's a perfect baby what's a perfect baby it's breathing okay what's a perfect baby okay it's alive what's a perfect baby it Everything is normal. It's a perfect thing. But it's not mature. So a mom and a dad smiles at his or her child even though there is not no maturity yet. Romans 8.31 What does it say? If God is If God is Again, if God is did you know this? God is not only with you, God is for you. God is not only with you, God is for you. That is the essence of grace. God is for you. God is not sitting up there, somewhere in heaven, And looking down on you saying, what can I punish next in this life? Or her life? Like, binabatay ka ng Diyos na magkamali. Kasi pag nagkamali ka, yes. Ma! Matitira ko din siya ng tinda. That is not how it is. God is for you. If, if you know the grace of God, you will experience being part of the family of God. God's love is unconditional. You don't have to measure up. You don't have to measure up. You know why? Because Christ has measured up for you. Letter L. Let God handle you know what the root is? You know what the root of perfectionism is? The desire to control. If you have the desire to control, that's the root. So you think that if you can just control things, then they'll be perfect. If I can control my spouse, then I'll have a perfect marriage. If I can control my kids, then they'll never get in trouble and they'll always be safe. If I can control my career, my path will be assured. If I can control the people around me, then the world will be a better place. So you have this desire. Control in the control in the control in the But as we talked about many times, most of your life actually is out of control. You can't control it. But that is an attempt to play God. God is God. You're not God. There's a lot of things. You don't have control. Uh, so what do you do when you can't control the uncontrollable things in your life? Look at this verse. First, Peter. 5, 7. Let's read it. Cast all your anxiety on Him because He cares for you. What is the essence of casting? What does that mean? You let go. Okay? You let go. To overcome perfectionism, you have to let go. Let go of your desire to control. Sometimes you think, if I can only control my kids, they will not end up as, as drug addicts. They will not end up as, as, uh, as bums. You can't control your kids. You can be the most loving parent you can ever be. But you can't control. Who was the parent of Adam? Who taught him? Who nurtured him? Who trained him? God himself. What did he do? He rebelled. People have what you call the skill of the power of choice. 
Our calling is not to control people. Our calling is to be the most loving people we can ever be. Let God handle things. Proverbs 14, 30. You want to live a long life? Who wants to live a long life? Memorize this verse. Our last attitude lengthens mass. Okay? So you have a good memorize. Things don't have to be perfect in order for you to be happy. Things don't have to be perfect for you to enjoy it. Is there such a thing as a perfect vacation? There's no perfect vacation. There's no perfect marriage. I'll say that again. There's no perfect marriage. You marry a sinner and she married a bigger one. Okay? So, nobody's perfect. There's no perfect marriage because you've got imperfect people. Who thinks you can put two imperfect people because and, and then you, you get a perfect relationship. There are no perfect kids. There's no perfect body. There's no perfect church. There's no perfect job. The Bible says nothing is perfect except the Word of God. So if you're waiting for the perfect environment for you to enjoy life, it's not going to happen. Right here, right now, because God is with you, because God loves you, because God will never change. Right here, right now, you can be the happiest person you can ever be, whatever the situation is. You can relax in the grace of God. You must learn to enjoy life in the middle of imperfection under less than perfect circumstances. Philippians 4.11, let's read it. I've learned to be content in whatever situation I am. I've learned to be content no matter what state I'm in. When you say learn, what does it mean? It's not automatic. Okay? You have to learn it. I've learned, Paul said, to be content in whatever situation I am. I, by nature, am not a contented person. Same with you. We're not contented people. It's not human nature to be content. It's something we have to learn. And you know, uh, advertisements, they just bombard us. Your life is not complete without this vacation. Your life is not complete without this stuff and that stuff. And you say, how? How in the world? Did, how, how in the world did I live without that? You say, my life isn't complete until I get that product, use that service, have that experience, look like that model. You have to learn to be content. It's learned. How do you learn to be content? Psalm, Psalm 23, verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not. That's why God, in His mercy, takes everything away from you. So that when all you have is Him, you find out that you have everything you need. Letter A. Act in faith, not fear. Okay. Act in faith, not fear. Ephesians 2 8, let's read it, for it is by grace. You have been saved through faith. That's the only way you can get saved. By grace. If you're not saved by grace, you're not saved. Okay? Because the only way you get saved is by grace. What is salvation? You get saved into worship. You get saved uh, into the purposes of God. You can you you are saved into the opportunity, eternal opportunity to know God for who He is. So how did you get into this relationship with God? Did you do something? It's by grace. How did you become a follower of Jesus? It's by grace. How did you have this opportunity to enjoy eternity? It is by grace. Now, how do you continue? Look at the next verse. Colossians 2 6, so then, let's read it. Just as you received 
Jesus Christ as Lord, continue to live in Him. You're not saved by grace and then live by works. But a lot of people think that I'm saved by God's free gift and now I really have to work hard to gain God's approval. That's how many people think. No, you don't. Question again. How are you saved? By? By grace. Okay? You are saved by grace. Now, question. Is it by promising to be perfect? No. How did you get into this relationship with Jesus? Is it by promising to give the Ten Commandments? No. It is by grace. Is it by promising to obey every rule? No. It is by grace through faith. That's how it started. That's how you continue your life as a follower of Jesus. Everything in your life comes from the grace of God. Everything that you have, the air you're breathing, every particle of food, the sun that shines on you, the mind that you have is a gift of grace, the ability to hear, the ability to see, the ability to walk, everything that you have in your life, God forgives you by grace, God guides you by grace, God strengthens you by grace. The talents you have, the gifts that you have, they are all given by grace. God blesses your life by grace. Your friends, your family, everything given by the grace of God. There's absolutely nothing in your life you earn. Now you say, I earn my salary. I earn my income. Now where did you get the ability to earn the money? Where did you get the hands and the brains? To earn that money, everything in your life you owe to God, it's all by grace. Now understanding this one truth is one thing, experiencing it is another thing. Today, okay, today, you can get out of the prison of perfectionism. Today, the door is unlocked. You can get out. You can trust in the grace of God. One of the symptoms of perfectionism is constant fatigue. Like you're always tired. Because you're always trying to control everything. You want to be the general manager of the universe. <laughs> One day you realize, I hope this is now happening to you. It's not up to me. I cannot control everything. I can relax. I can let go. I don't have to try to make things perfect in order to prove my worth. God accepts me just as I am. I am significant to God. I am valuable, valuable to Him. Apart from any words, apart from any accomplishment, apart from perfection. So get ready. Letter E. What is letter E? Exchange. My perfectionism for God's peace. Perfectionism destroys peace. You're going to live with one or the other. You're going to live with perfectionism or you're going to live with peace. It's your choice. Either you live as this person who tries to control everyone, everything, every circumstance, every situation, you can choose to live as a person who tries to prove your value and importance and significance by trying to be blameless and faultless and without any wrong. It's going to be a life of misery. It's going to be a life of sadness. It's going to be a life of emptiness. Or you can live in peace. You can exchange your perfectionism. You give it up. You cast it. Cast all your cares to God. And then... Take this promise, Matthew 11 and verse 20, 29. Let's read it. Are you tired? Worn out? Burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Learn the unforced rhythm.
God is perfect. And because God is perfect, He expects His children to be perfect. Jesus even said, Be ye therefore perfect. But God also knows there's no chance you can make yourself perfect. That's why there is grace. That's why He gave Jesus, who is perfect, so that the perfection of Jesus becomes yours. Don't copy Christ's perfection. Can I say that again? Don't copy the perfection of Jesus. Rather, receive the perfection of Jesus. The perfection of Jesus is not meant to be imitated. It's meant to be received and embraced. It is meant to be yours. As you read the Bible, you read God's perfect standard of perfection, and you know you cannot measure up to that. So God came up with grace, even before the foundation of the world. Are you going to fail in life? You're going to fail many responsibilities that you've been given. You're going to fail to live up to the expectations that other people have placed on you. You're going to let them down. You're going to fail your own expectations. And of course, you're going to fail measuring up to God's standard of perfection. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But even when you fail, you don't have to worry. You don't have to worry if you have allowed the grace of God in you. There is only one failure you ever need to worry about. And in our last verse, it says, Be careful that no one fails to receive God's grace. This is the only failure you have to worry about. As without the grace of God, all hope is lost. There will be no peace, there will be no meaning, there will be no direction, there will be no time. Give up. Exchange your perfectionism with the peace of God. And you can receive it right now. But I'm not yet perfect. That's why it's a perfect time. But I still have many weaknesses. That's why there is grace. Will you receive? Will you embrace? Will you breathe in? And grace. Shall you all stand? Great God in heaven. There's nothing we can do to measure up to your perfect sin. There's nothing we can do, Father.
bring out to our woman now. Father, help us now to give up on ourselves. To give up on the idea there is something to do. Help us to cast all our burdens to Jesus. Help us, Father, to exchange our perfectionism to the peace that comes from Help us, Father, to welcome your grace and your plan for our life. Open our eyes. We want this. We want to sing this song for you. May you be your life.
everlasting arms. And whatever happens, God will never let go of you. Your safety is not dependent on how much and how strong your grip is. It depends on God's will. And God never tires. He never gets weary. Whatever happens, He'll take hold of you and will never let you go. Receive God's grace with you and let Him accept you. Allow Him to love every day of your life. Thank you, Father. You have been with us. You have blessed us so much. Thank you for the prayer. Thank you for all your love. Thank you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. And everyone's name. Amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand of praise.